Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore Latinos anymore. Work from all around the world you can come and see and talk about. It starts out a little thing, you write a bit. You have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. So uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, watching our little propaganda video. Uh, it's all true. Uh, 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 we, we say my name is Frank Hensch, and I'm the director of the Siegel Center here. And uh, this is a special evening for us. Not only um, it is the end of the uh, great, great fall season. We had Prelude Festival, uh, Japan Playwright Exchange, the, the Device Theater Workshop, uh, the Dante Project from Italy and uh, students who did a 68 stage to sit in, who we worked with, and performing knowledge, six or seven students from the building here from different disciplines performed their research as work with their bodies and many, many other things. So, um, uh, so we are very thrilled uh, to coming to a close to a season. And as I worked with Bob Wilson, and Wilson always said, Bob said, listen, you need a good beginning and you need a good end. In the middle, if you don't know what you're doing, you can be mysterious. You get away, but beginning and end has to be good. So, and I think this is also why we put uh, uh, this event uh, where we have it now, because it is important. Publishing, I think, for the theater is right in the center of what we do. We do Bridge Academia and 
professional theater, international and American theater, and we are a small independent publisher. We know how much work goes into publishing books, how significant it is, what it means for everybody um, being involved. I think Jackie Kennedy said, if you only publish one book in your life, you did something good for the universe. So, um, and we are now, uh, even though there are only nine books, we are the largest publisher of pl uh, Ara Place in English translation. No one does it. So as often we at the Siegel Center do things we will not find someone else or won't be, uh, won't be presented by. Why do what already is out there anyway? So for us, it's a truly a great, a great honor to have back uh, with us Three Hole Press, 53rd State Press, Ugly Duckling Press, and the great Mac Wellman, um, who is behind so many uh, uh, new writers. We had once a great evening, the <coughs> Mac Wellman School of Playwriting here. We had the Downtown Theater the book event here and many, many others. And also we collaborated with these publishing houses. So it is of real significance. This is a work uh, dedicated in a way to the gods of the theater, but uh, really uh, we would like to show our appreciation and our respect. Uh, we uh, are also are CUNY, we're not NYU and Columbia, but still we have some resources as little as they are, but for you guys to go out there, publish, have the idea, get through it, put it out there, uh, get it printed. It's such a, an enormous undertaking and uh, it is so, so very important. Let me talk a little bit more about what it really means to publish right now where we um, are. And um, the uh, structure of the evening will be, we're gonna have a short reading in the beginning, it's in your uh, program here. Um, then we, uh, all the participants, including the artists, will come uh, uh, up here and we have a, they will present themselves, who they are, what they work for. Mac will then give a little statement, his thoughts on contemporary uh, publishing for performance and theater. And at the end, uh, we will hopefully have also a discussion with you, a Q&A. We always have great audiences. It is important to have great theater and performance, but it's also important to have really good audiences. So thank you for coming, and you are a great audience always at the Siegel for taking time out of your busy life to engage um, with the uh, publishers here. So really, we don't take that for granted. It's a very busy season any time, but especially now. So really, thank you for your interest, and I think it's also of real importance to um, our publishers and, uh, and artists. So, and afterwards at the archive bar, since it's the end of the season, we have a little reception. It's on 36th, between 5th and Madison on the uh, south side, just in the middle of the archive. We always think Burgess would like that idea. That's called the archive. And uh, hope you will join us. And um, we're gonna start now. If you have your cell phone, please do take it out. I'll do the same and make sure it is on silent, uh, ring or silent or whatever, so it should not ring. So again, um, thank you very much. And now we come um, to the very beginning and to the first readings. Thank you. Annie and Daimar, both of you. So, you know, this will be like way better. Will not be To be and not to be, such is the fate. To be and not there be, these is the body. <laughs> to be and not to be, all is a color. To be and not to be, those is an exercise. To be or not to be, some is a man. To be and not to be, all is the fortune. Whether tis nobler by the pause to say, to be and not to be, <laughs> all is the precurse. While tis stronger in a name to put the nations and uses of poor appointment and to keep eyes at the life of bodies. To be and not to be, all is the sister. 
lest tis nearer for the line to speak and words and reasons of hot joy, and to think sighs into the custom of gods, and to breaking pray them? To play, to bring, neither lesser, and in the skin there curd we bend the lambs and the four good officers that love is day in. Tis a true love alone to be strutted, <laughs> to quit, to make, to hear, well there sleep. Oh, there's the kingdom. To be and not to be, this is the all. And tis stronger but a part to act, the means and feet of ready advice, or to signify passages with a rogue of months, and to working molt them, <laughs> their budge, to point, no more. And but the land to overrule, we count the sum and the twain cruel friends that temperance is thought upon. Tis the brook merely to be murdered, <laughs> to laugh, to believe, to set, very to protest. Nay, there's the shape, in in this countenance of devil which fates may hear, where we have seen, for these female hent, shall pester us rogue. There's the tongue that serves soul of out fair nickname, as what might think the gallows and brothers of queen, the brothers cunning, the sweaty king's passion, the occasions of sheeted humanity, the barber's palm, the flesh of providence, and the turnip, that eager brevity of the strange draws, where she itself might her length go with the main abridgment, who should fingers chide, their consent and reveal for the kind love, but that a body of something to father, the mad damnation with who canon no soul chances, grows the bride bed and treads us, rather let such cunnings we have than believe for secrets that we convey not of. Yet soul does throw schoolfellows of us every. <laughs> and so the own drop of nomination is gone on at the particular daughter of end, and times of potent difference and stomach with all platform their heels weigh so and give the head of matter. Foolish you hither, a crescent fortinbras, die, for thy flames are this my hits loosed. To be and not to be, all is the grace. To be and not to be, much is the action. Thanks. <laughs>
I don't think hate means not helping. I remembered you. I remembered that there was something good about you. I see and I remember and it makes me sad. I never expected to hear myself glitching like this. I understand now that the greatest love affair of my life has been with my own decay. I'm passionately in love with my own rotting. That was a stupid thing to say. Anyway, eventually I got a fork and I started piercing my pimple with the fork. I started stabbing at it slowly and then hard and it oozed and broke. And I heard the pimple screams as it, as it died. And as it was dying, it pointed out everything I'd ever done in my life that was shitty and petty and selfish and deceitful. It knew about how I'd squeezed my cat so hard and wished it would die. It knew about all these times I emotionally cheated on my big boyfriend. It knew how sometimes I would watch myself grieving and wonder whether my grief was beautiful and marketable and cool. It also told me how and when I would die and then the pimple died. But the hole won't stop bleeding on my face, so now I have to keep this bandage on my face. And now almost everything I say these days is heavy with the weight of my death. I have that wisdom about me. Isn't that cool? Oh, fuck. Anyway, it's important to surrender and we are given ourselves by God. How wonderful, how wonderful it's getting. And then I think I really do think that someone hit me on the back of the head. I could hardly understand them. Do you see the way they looked at me? I had these horrible nightmares, these shuttle, shuttles in the sky getting higher and higher, falling off the tracks and plumbing down. But I realized recently, I remembered from the dream that there's always all this time before the shuttles goes off the tracks. This time when people are just looking at me, all these beautiful young people across the car, the edges of their eyes twitching, someone looks away, someone doesn't. No one sits next to me. And then I hear someone say, this is the street where it lives, which is what I heard one day when I was five playing in my yard. It, it, this is the street where it lives. And I ran into my house and my father was weeping and praying with his tefillin, phylactery spooling out of his head, and he shouted at me. And then her uncle says, no, Sasha, that's my memory. And then she keeps talking. <laughs> <laughs> You have to go a bit earlier, right? So we maybe yeah. can put you here. Yes, yeah, you sit here. You sit here. You sit here. Okay, you sit here. You sit here. You suppose sit here. And we're going to get Mike's Mike, You put them on right away. And, um, and our idea was that. Um, just for the beginning, everybody will introduce uh, himself. Hey, sit down. I have to go. Okay, and um, and 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 uh, then we know a little bit more uh, who is who, and uh, so let's get the evening started. M maybe a bit about you, and then we come back to you with your statement. <clears throat> I'm Mac Wellman. I teach playwriting at Brooklyn College, where many of these scary people have come from. And you're a playwright. I I do that. Yes. Uh, I'm Annie Dorson, and I've never. Unfortunately, been taught by Michael. <laughs> well, not not directly, I guess. And you are? A I, I'm a theater maker. I'm Matt Bay from Ugly Duckling Press. Um, um, we'll, 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 you'll probably know more about it soon when we get to talking, but we do a performance series and uh, publishing series, so that's why um, I'm here. Although I used to be involved in the theater, and I translate some theatrical works now and then. I'm Kate Kramer, and I'm running 53rd State Press. I'm also a playwright, um, and my preferred pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm Corinne Donnelly. I wrote a play called Wood Calls Out to Wood that's being published by 53rd State in, I don't know, a few months. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. Hello, I'm Rachel Cowdernail Buff. I founded and I direct Three Hole Press. I'm also a writer, and I write plays, and I go by she, her. Um, my name is Daima Mubashir, and I'm a playwright. And um, I wrote 
um, I'm part of this, and um, um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm a playwright. <laughs> <laughs> Will Arbery, uh, I wrote, I'm a playwright. I wrote Wheelchair, published by Three Hole Press. He, him. Wonderful, so we have a little idea who you really are. And, um, but uh, Mac, uh, who said to us about the evening, listen, Frank, there are enough readings all over the city, not that they are not important, but let's talk about publishing and have that at the center, and this was always the idea of this evening. So, um, give us your thoughts. Publishing in New York for theater and performance. Sure. Uh, when I moved to New York in the middle 70s and, and uh, started looking around, I noticed after a while that there were almost no new plays being published. I thought this was very odd. <clears throat> and um, I talked to a publisher friend of mine, Douglas Messerly, who ran Sun and Moon Press, and we did an anthology of plays that was just to start, and then I think I've published six or seven others. But even before that, when I first moved to New York, <clears throat> I did a uh, anthology that came out on cassette tapes. Uh, and it was, uh, I went to all these strange writers, including uh, Jackson McLeod, uh some of the language poets, <clears throat> and uh, for the hell of it, I called up somebody named John Cage who lived in the West Village, and I said, can I record you? And he said, sure. So I had a huge tape recorder, and I lugged it over to his apartment and recorded him um, reading, writing through Finnegan's Wake, which was kind of amazing in his apartment. <clears throat> and that made a huge impression on me. And I, I think that publishing plays is very important because the theater changes completely every 10 years or so. And it's very important that new work be published, and, and these people are doing a wonderful job of making all of this happen, so I'm delighted to be here in support of their efforts. God help them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel is still missing? <clears throat> um, basically, the New York Times stopped reviewing plays as literature in, in the McCarthy days, and they never started again. Uh, that, I think, is terrible. And they're just, there's not enough coverage of plays as written texts. I also write poetry and novels. When I get fed up with theater, I write a novel. When I get fed up with fiction, I write poetry. When I get fed up with poetry, I write a play again. There's no re <laughs> writing is writing. It all should be treated equally. And it's very important to do that. And these people are very important uh, in, in making this happen. I open the floor to you. What are your reactions? I was, I was just going to say that uh, 53rd State Press would not have, I don't think, existed had it not been for Mac. Uh, and Corinne Keithley Sires founded the press in 2007 very much with the idea of uh, preserving and documenting the work of um, a coterie of people who were um, coming out of, uh, out, of Mac, out of Brooklyn College especially. And so... Um, so I do think that it, the, the press has at its, at its core um, this idea of, of preserving what's happening in the moment here in the downtown theater. I have a, I have a question for that maybe is to Mac or for anyone. What, I mean, what is, um, I agree with you about the literary part, but what is important about publishing work, experimental, let's say, or difficult work that is uh, made for the theater, but not necessarily in the form of a play um, that is literature. I mean, there's this distinction, and the theater makers seem to like to make a distinction between drama and, and what, you know, readable drama and what they're doing. But I'm just curious, as a devil's advocate question, why publish it in the, book, in the form of books? Because are books helping playwrights as much as productions of plays, you know? I think so, because... Uh I, I don't make such a huge distinction between poetry and plays. And oftentimes, I would stumble across a play that it, uh, had been published, uh, and it made a huge impact on me. And other times, I, I, I wondered where I could read the damn thing, and I couldn't find it. Um, because people don't, for a long time, were not publishing them, and they're still not publishing them 
enough, I think. Um, I think all writing is performative to, to some extent, and uh, plays need to be read, and it's important to have a, a text that you can go back to and look at again and again and again, because sometimes, especially if it is difficult, it's important to put it down and then go back and, and look at it again. Can I jump in here? I think all of the artists who are on stage right now are answers to that question because their work all exists in this kind of third space that's not only meant for the stage and not only meant to be read, but meant to be read and then sort of considered for the stage. If you look at, um, I mean, if you look at Annie's, the excerpt that Annie Dorson just read, will, will you hold that out so people can see it? Um, and same with, oh, oh this, yeah, or just the, the page where you were reading from. Um, and same with Wills, like what, what do you do with the script that um, is so visual where the layout of the page says as much as the language itself? Actually, Will, could you find the section that you read from? Um, and, and Daima too, everyone who's here who has a script, like I think it would be really exciting to hold that out. What, what do we do with this aspect of the work and how can it reach people? And I think all of us are working. <laughs> this is so exciting. You're really seeing the work in process. The binder, Three Hole Press, by the way, is called Three Hole Press because of a three hole binder, which I don't always get to say, but here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, if you look at work like this, how can this kind of work be as legitimate as a play that you see? This is its own art form, um, and I think all of us believe in that so deeply, and there isn't enough space for that. Um, I, so I really thank Mac Wellman for taking that so seriously, um, and I think that's part of your pedagogy. As a student studying with Mac Wellman, I was always so curious why you never assigned, or you didn't assign plays to read as much as philosophy and history and literature. And I think that's because historically, playwrights have also been poets and philosophers and novelists. Um, so there's much more room for interdisciplinary conversation um, that, that feels like it's missing today, except for the people in this room. Yeah. One thing that occurs to me, and it, I don't know how to explain it, but good writing always looks good on the page. If, if it looks bad on the page, it's probably not good writing. <laughs> I have no idea why. <laughs> in terms of layout or font <laughs> or the size of the all page? Of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. <laughs> Corinne's strange text there. Yeah, very beautiful. <laughs> I don't know. I have a strange relationship to the to this to this conversation about about playwriting uh, because I don't. I'm not a playwright, um, and uh, m almost all of my pieces are um, generated in real time by an algorithm that I helped to develop, um, or sort of guided the development of. Let's say, uh, and so this you know frozen thing here that's now in print is one of I don't know a hundred billion possible outputs that the same algorithm could generate. Um, and in each performance, the text is different. The structure's the same, but the, the text is different. The word choices are different. So the book is always the same. The book is always the same, unfortunately. Um, it's all 700 something copies. <laughs> um, so so it's, a, it's a funny thing, you know, because when I was uh, um, sort of coming up and, and getting trained as a theater director, it, we were all so insistent on the performance is the art form and any attempt to capture it, either through video recording or through publication, was going to be some other form. You know, that was not better or worse, but was a different thing. Um, and uh, so I wonder, I don't know, I mean, that's also maybe, this is sort of interesting to me because I also feel somehow that there's, uh, that in, in my work I've become interested again in plays, um, surprisingly, and, and very recently, since this, I would say. Um, but uh, You I must know. have fallen down and hit your head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> daily. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if, if, I mean, any of the other writers uh, want to talk about how they view um, their playwriting practice in relation to the performance and the 
the end publication as, as part of the writing side of it. Um, this has, the publishing this play, uh, because it created a lot of questions, a lots and lots of questions about what is a performance um, after it's published because um, this particular play <laughs> is kind of impossible. And because of publishing, because I knew that this play was written for to be published, I was able to, um, um, I think, go wilder, go harder, and think in a different way. Um, and at the same time, I still have questions about how this will be performed, and it should be, you know, um, and I think it can be very, very simply, but it was really, really exciting to um, be a part of a process that sort of upends or um, picks at the seams of what theater industry is here, um, because, oh, whoops, whatever. Um, um, I've gotten I, curious of uh, someone who came across this book and was like, well, why did you get it published? Because um, when we publish a play, that means it's done. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> cool. Um, so, but, but I know that this, th this particular book might be done, but there's all kinds of ways that people um, disrupt a performance, uh, disrupt the idea of a published play, even after it's successful, even after it's on Broadway. So I think that this particular um, thing that we're doing is upending what industry thinks it is, and I think that's exciting. It's really exciting to think about the way that you describe the, the published or the paper version of the play as a kind of laboratory for what could be later, that there's some way in which the page space offers more a, a more um, a larger and more adventurous playground mm -hmm. than um, the contemporary theater, and that it's somehow like the, the impossible is more accessible on the page. Right. My, my experience with this was almost like the opposite, like, um, uh, this was written for a very specific person, and um, you know, we initially uh, basically like it seems unlikely, not not out of the realm of possibility, but probably unlikely that we'll be able to do it again. And so, um, and I think Rachel like offered this to me after seeing it uh, first. She saw it first. We did like a sort of staged reading, um, and. Um, and then she read it and then she offered it to me and this book became a sort of um, like a um, memorial to like a night to like December 19th, 2016 at Dixon Place. Like the, this, that's what this book is. And so there is this sort of like, um, like uh, I don't know, I think it's cool. <laughs> I think it's cool <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. Cool institution. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm most excited by the like um, dual lives that are possible in the theater. And I love a life on the page because I love reading. And so I think it was exciting for me to think about writing a script that, that um, really rewarded readers, like people who would interact with the page. Um, so I think a lot about, um, you know, like sound and the way that sound uh, has many lives in a space. I can say a word like here and you don't know if I'm saying here or here necessarily. On the page you know, but when it's said you don't. And so to sort of like um, let homonyms and, and the, all of the dualities that are possible between page and stage exist was I think one of the projects of this play, which makes it exciting that it has now, or it will have a life, <laughs> a published life. <laughs> I think, yeah, there's an element of that in both Will and Daima's work too that I want to highlight. Um, I mean, Will, you wrote your play to be performed. You never thought it would be published, but the whole second half of the play is written um, for uh, furniture to speak. And so when you see that performed, you don't know that a character is actually called chair in a stage direction or fan. And you know, we saw one interpretation of that that night, but I still think it's so exciting for a reader who's never seen that 
to read that and wonder how to direct that. Um, and so there's, even though your play is so possible and was so, and, and happened, um, I feel like it invites, for both of your works, like Daima said, it inv and everyone here invites so much creativity as a reader. I think reading scripts is the most creative, active way to read. And I wish people outside of theater knew that. I, that's like my, that's my project as a publisher is how can people outside of drama and performance and dance know that this work is really innovative and evolving and exciting? Um, because I think we all read new fiction and poetry, but I, I, it doesn't go both ways. The bridge, it's a one-way bridge. And how can it be a two-way bridge? <laughs> oh, if it's all right, I would say something also about the process for some of the emergency play script books. Um, Not Knowing by Mike Taylor, for example, starts at page 44 on the cover. Um, and that maybe gives you an idea of some of the ways that um, we attempted to um, uh, create a book that respected the form of the performance uh, that Mike created with a number of people collaboratively with a lot of uh, complicated um, um, mixing of video and, and live performance. Um, so, uh, and, and also like a, a ton of references to uh, the, the Wild Bunch with Lauren Brando and all kinds of weird, weird stuff that had to go into the book and had to be formatted in ways that represented um, the, the kind of collisions going on in the, f in the piece. And that Mike Taylor did not imagine that the piece in the kitchen would ever be a book or be a play that would be in a book. But um, having approached her in sort of a similar way that we approached Annie um, after kind of learning about the performance and seeing the performance, um, we were interested in how do you deal with this weird thing that happens in the theater and doesn't usually doesn't become a book or doesn't become a play where there's no original text exactly from which to make to of which uh, which can be published um, and and also then to make the next step possible which is the re can a work created in that manner or in those manners be accessible for a possible reperformance the way that a play is, right? A play is on the page, different directors read it, different people interpret it differently. You put it on the stage in different places, at different times, different casts. So can that be done, um, can, can that be done with performances that aren't scripted to begin with? And that was one of the things that we are most interested, that is one of the things we're most interested in this play script series uh, of which, um, and th that, is mostly true, although we've done different things. And one thing I wanted, so the other thing we were interested in is dance in particular and notation for dance. So the, the series also published this work by Hijikata uh, Kastaman Fas, which is actually one of the dancer's notebooks, um, one of the dancer's notebooks uh, for learning the dance, this uh, Bhutto dance in the six, late 60s. Um, and that that would otherwise, you know, not be scripted except through a communication with the uh, choreographer um, and keeping of the notebook as a kind of personal place of reference for how the dance is to be done. So, um, and this is a bilingual publication with the Japanese and the drawings and the English translation. So. Um, one thing that is, interests us in the series is not only the play, but also the um, any media, any kind of performance, right, dance, et cetera, that can be uh, can potentially become a book that we can then, as Max said, which I agree with, revisit, right, that you can revisit. I, I love the idea that in Annie's case, you know, the book is just one performance of the of the text, and we worked a lot together on figuring out how exactly to make what looks kind of like a play, but you'll see there's also lots of code and all sorts of stuff in there, um, and to make the page work a little bit like the, the rhythm of each act in the, in the algorithms, in the algorithmic uh, uh, acts, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so anyway, and then the other thing, 
that we do in relationship to that is have this, I don't know, some of you might know this, the emergency index which allows, allows performers to document their own work. And that's a very different thing, but it is about paper publication and the possibility that a performance that one does just once, um, oh, thank you, once, I know it's <laughs> square, um, I hate that. Um, uh, just one night or one, you know, one brief or maybe a durational performance that only two people see because it's done in some kind of basement somewhere or a field that you have to travel very far to, but that that is somewhere, somehow documented on paper and not uh, toggling back and forth from existence to non-existence on the web um, and potentially that way people could actually, that the performers in this book could actually communicate with each other and talk about their work through um, those connections. Um, and as Max mentioned, poetry, um, uh, this, is, this book is the selected performances of Cecilia Vicuña, but uh, it is actually also in a way a book of her poems. Um, and that those things overlap. A lot of the texts are poems, but then there's descriptions of how and reactions of audience members to sort of docu to, to document how the poems are performed, how they become performances, how, how they become texts for performances. Um, so um, I'm interested in all of this, uh, this kind of p potential of the book to do that, though I uh, I, I also w wonder who, you know, s some people read them. <laughs> um, it's not the easiest, it's a lot easier to sell a book of poetry or a book of fiction, even a, even a book of poetry, even a book of translated poetry. I have found, <laughs> I have found it, because Ugly Duckling does a lot of other things, poetry, mostly poetry, and a lot of translation. So my experience with that is that people, more people will actually buy a book of poetry by someone who didn't even write it in English. And that translation process is like the theater to play or play script process. Um, uh, but nonetheless, just more people buy them and read them, <laughs> in my experience. Maybe that's not true for the drama, like the play play, but I, I don't I know. I think only actors and directors read drama. I think for three whole, I've noticed the only way of getting someone to read a play who isn't in the theater is so analog, it's literally like bringing a book to someone's lap. And then they'll read one of these plays and then they'll say, I didn't know I could read a play. And then they'll recommend it. And it's like the slow, slow, slowest work and that's why I'm so amazed at actually how long Ugly Duckling Press has been around because I, I thought that I could kind of do this from my desk, and now I see, I'm so happy that Derek, who runs um, the McNally Jackson Theater section is here, because I feel like the, I've discovered that the, the way to create more openings is by talking to people, like going to bookstores, and literally saying, like, do you read new plays, and have you read this play, and will you read this play, and let's talk about it, and that, so much has come out of those really slow conversations. Um, but I feel like, oh, it's interesting that Max said every 10 years there's a new definition of theater, a new form of theater, because um, that gives me hope for like everyone working to carve out more room in this landscape that Ugly Duckling Press has really paved the way for. But it is actual work. <laughs> it's actual work. I have a question um, for everyone here, which is what becomes possible when your work is on the page, and, and in particular for the writers, like now that your work is published, do you have an ideal vision of how someone reads your work? Like, because it's not limited to the context of a live event, do you want it to be read in one sitting? Do you want it to be returned to? Do you want it to be read in the morning? Like, what, what is your ideal way for your work to be encountered? I, do you have one? As a book? For this particular play, no, I feel like I've asked quite a bit <laughs> um, already. <laughs> um, and uh, what I'll say is no, because I, the uh, one story is, um, I'm really glad that this play was published because I'm not 
sure that some of my family would, of course they'd come to New York and see something if something was up, you know. Um, but my cousin, who I rarely talk to, um, has read the book. And she's someone I never expected to come to me and say, I completely understand you. And she read the book and, and, and Facebook me, of course, and was like, I completely got every word that you were talking about. And that was a magical experience because sometimes I, I being in New York and being an ex experimental kind of theater maker, I think that I may not be accessible to everyone. And, and this proved all of that wrong. And so th having something that people can read has, um, sort of equalized what drama can be, and that give, that also gives me hope. Right. I think it's really um, <clears throat> interesting what people do with your work. One of the first plays I ever wrote, I wrote it as a kind of joke. I thought it was really silly, and we had a reading of it at this theater, and a couple actors read it, and, and they turned to me and said, "That's really moving." And I thought, really moving? What the hell are you talking about? <clears throat> but I, I oftentimes I find out what the thing means by having it performed. And I don't know what it means necessarily until it's performed. If you, if you are absolutely sure of what it means, then you shouldn't do theater. <laughs> uh, I like to see what people do with it. And sometimes things turn out well and sometimes they don't. It's, that's very interesting to me. <clears throat> Maybe um, 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 a question coming back to the concept of the book for the three publishers. What was the most complicated thing, book or project you struggled with conceptually? How to put something on a page where you said, you know, I, how could we even do that? Or what? So we get a little bit from your thought process. What is, because I think one of your contributions truly is to reflect the mise en scène on a, of text on a white page. So what were, what were projects you struggled with? What solutions did you find? And what was exciting about it? I'm interested listening to this conversation to be to be reflecting back on the books that um, 53rd State Press has published, which um, and and to think about how the landscape that we've begun to build over the past 10 years um, reflects on this conversation. Because I'm I'm hearing um, like th maybe three main impulses or three main um, uh, notions behind publishing plays, an idea of documentation, of documenting something that has happened and may not happen again or may not happen elsewhere, um, an idea of dissemination and of um, making, making something uh, available to a much broader community, um, and then an idea that uh, the page space has this sort of radical potential to, um, to reshape the way that we're um, experiencing theater live also, that it has a kind of formative presence. Um, and I think that 53rd State Press has, um, has fallen into those, those three categories, that we, um, we have like a, an expanded documentation series, which I haven't brought any examples of that tonight, but um, Neil Medlin's Pop Star series is a wonderful example of that, with, um, which he uh, has you know, full page spreads with pictures and with um, descriptions of how the, how the play was written alongside the play itself. Um, little uh, books like what Corinne Keithley, uh, Keithley's Montgomery Park, to me is a play that's imagining into its into a new uh, way of, of making theater and of imagining it. Um, and also, uh, the, in terms of documentation and in terms of thinking about dance, the field guide to I landing. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting to hear those three strands coming back um, in through all of these plays. And I'm, I'm very excited to publish Corinne's play because it feels like it's at the nexus of all three of those in terms of being um, a play that's, ex I, I think it's gonna be challenging to put on a page. I mean, it is challenging to put on a page, but it is so much about that pageness and about the movement between page and sound or between um, paper and and the world, um, and that it and that it's also doing wild and strange new things and can reshape um, or begin to shape performance also going forward. 
I've been mulling on your question, Frank. The hardest project. I think for me the hardest one was the first one because uh, it was really trial by fire. I knew these publishers existed. Um, Ugly Duckling, 53rd State, um, Plays in Verse, um, there are a few others. But, and I, and I had experience in publishing as a writer, but I had no experience in indie publishing, which is just completely different. Um, and basically, uh, all that I knew was that my friends and peers in the theater were writing exciting plays. So I asked Alicia Harris, can I publish your play? And I didn't really know what that meant, but she said yes. And then I worked with a graphic designer who was my mentor, and we printed this book, and then only after it was printed was I like, oh shit, I have to store these books somewhere. And then I realized I, could, I had to find a place that was big enough to store them, and I had to talk about that with my roommates. And then <laughs> I kind of finagled that. And then, then I realized, oh, okay, now I have to ship these books. How do I do that? And then I had to buy a printer. And then I bought a printer. And then I spent a lot of time mailing things. And then I said, oh, I have to have an intern. And just like every step of the way, um, I wish that I had talked more with Matt Fye and <laughs> <laughs> uh, people before starting this. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened. But yeah, the first one, like literally every step of the way, I, I, it felt like um, very dramatic and a big learning curve. It was really exciting, but um, I just had no uh, sense of what it, what it would take from the beginning. Yeah, how really hands-on it is. What was it like for your first book? Yeah, I mean, it's very similar story. <laughs> we started with, Z I, we started Seeds, and actually the first performance-related publication we did was the Emergency Gazette, who maybe someone here is old enough to remember in the late 90s when there was like uh, the few off-off-Broadway things that were being printed about like, you know, uh, reviewing downtown theater just folded and there was this gap. And so we did this broadsheet that was free in all the theaters in the Lower East Side and everywhere and other cities too and got out to the rat group and all of that. So um, that whole project was sort of our, our first theatrical project. It was a broadside of or a, news, a newspaper, a newsletter. I mean, it was only like every couple of weeks we were doing this thing, but we realized we had to distribute it. We had to get people to write for it. We wrote for it a lot of the time because we had to fill it up with, you know, and go see shows and stuff. So um, the nice thing about yeah, it start we started slow. We didn't we didn't start with big books, um, but when we did, we also had those troubles, and that brings me to thinking around the problem of distribution and audience because, you know, my my mother my mother's generation totally read plays. It was just part of literature. Uh, and uh, my generation probably less so, the next generation even less so. Like it's not as, apart from, I guess, Shakespeare, who else, Lope de Vega, I don't know what, huh? Chekhov. Chekhov maybe, yeah, you read those, but maybe, maybe, maybe you don't, I don't know, Does, do people still read Chekhov in school? So, um, you know, I, as, especially as arts and humanities is, you know, moving, we're moving away from that in our educational, educational system. I don't know if people will read plays in the same way as they still read fiction, and it's not what's marketed, right? So maybe there are ways that the few of us publishing this kind of work can create distribution systems or audiences specifically for reading plays or reading scripts or play scripts or whatever, performance on the page. Um, however, because we have a very broad variety of those things here, represented here. Um, for us, for me, the most complicated thing, um, you know, and, and it's interesting too because like, I, I don't know, there's the drama bookshop, but that's like probably about it, and I don't know that they're interested in all kinds of drama, and in fact, I think... They're going out of business too. <laughs> yeah. And they're going out of business. So, um, but I do think that, um, you know, the poetry audience is very strong for like 53rd State, for instance, I know a lot of poets who read Corinne Keithley and Kristen Cosmos and read them as writers, you know, and the, a lot of the people that 53rd State has published, the, the Joyce Cho's and all of that. And, um, you know, part of that is Mac's program and 
like a, a program that teaches writing and theater, right? Um, playwright, really playwriting, new playwriting. Um, right now I'm working on a piece uh, with uh, my colleagues at UDP um, by uh, Ivor Finley, Joey Truman, and Claudia LaRocca. And it is, and it's a, a couple other people involved. It's a, it's basically a dance piece with a film and weird soundtrack mum mumbling and this bit bits and bits of text that come through and I we're we're very much struggling to make this why we decided to <laughs> make it a book we thought it would be an interesting project but it's going to, it's been really complex and we have image we have like artifacts like the letters written between um, two of the people involved so all this scrawled letter stuff and like all this texture of what the play performance was made from in an attempt to elicit some of the effect of what that performance was like without it being the, of course you could you know sign on to on the boards and watch a version of it but it actually you know does that give you the same thing I don't know that if you were there so I, I'm I've been really interested in this thing of like making what is a performance out of its refuse, out of its like dis disjecta membra of like what is left over and what is, uh, uh, what is, what are the scraps that it came, came to make that play and so forth, so, or that performance. And so yeah. that's been an interesting First struggle. of all, you know, congratulations on 25 years, is that? Actually, that thing for us is amazing. The emergency index, yeah, also as a concept and the, way to ask the performers to, to, to document their plays, truly um, exceptional and in, in, in the sense of the, of the uh, traditional avant-garde uh, uh, of a documentation of writing and the process and also that's alive uh, on a page. Before we come to audience question, maybe a, a question to writers and also to the publishers, if there would be the support that should be, that is there perhaps in other countries, if you go to look to France or Germany, there's more available. But you as publishers, what would you do if you would be get the support that's out there, or playwrights um, uh, or writers for for your plays? What would you, how would what would you like to see well, that's not there in the world? That if there would be support, what would you do? I have to go right now, but uh, <laughs> I know one thing that would make a huge difference. Uh, I think in Germany. Uh, you have to pay royalties to dead writers. So in other words, every time somebody does a Shakespeare play, or you'd have to pay royalties. All, and all that is, was used in Germany, I think, until recently, to support the arts. And nobody thinks of that here. <clears throat> and it's ways like that. There, there's just a lot of ways to, to make money. Well, the, the, the idea also was that Peter Stein would change 10 lines of Shakespeare play. And they say, this well, is my translation. So. Uh, of that old one, so then he would they, they get the and put them back in. Yeah. They go into a fund to s support the arts. Yeah, that's a great idea. But thank you for joining us. I know you have to go, and really uh, thank you for being uh, uh, such a significant uh, supporter of the movement and creator. Thank you. Thank you. Man. But um, to you all, what would you what would you do if you um, could publish? Uh, what you wonder what would be an ideal way. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I first, I, like when, when I started talking to uh, Jelena Guzman and, and Matvey about doing this, like I actually think UDP is so cool. I mean, I, I feel like I have, it really, I feel like I have this whole, um, you know, I don't know, like fantasy because I, I saw, you know, artists in Europe, like artists self-published um, books I see everywhere, like Martin Spangberg has been making these books for ages, uh, um, along with his uh, former uh, partner, Tor Lindstrom, and they did this international festival project and had books publicated, you know, in the Everybody's Dance Collective in, in Belgium. Uh, and I just feel like I was always seeing these like really cool um, artist self-publications. Um, and UDP feels like the, the better version of that <laughs> in a way that it's really, I don't know, driven by Artists, but it still feels like an artist's book. It doesn't feel like um, your the work is being fit into a format that has to do with, the, you know, publisher standards or something like this. So I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't. I, that's not helpful. But uh, that's my response. Like an artist would like go to MoMA. You get a book about an artist's work, which is on so much on writing and essays and photos and drawings. 
So a lot of Oh, yeah, that yeah. wasn't the thing I was talking about. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> I was talking about like Martin Spengberg collecting his own writing oh, okay. and self-publishing, like get a little grant to get a little piece of money from the Swedish Arts Council and like mm. make a silver book from yeah. collected, you know, materials that artists are giving him, or make a little book of his own blog posts, or like uh, um, anyway. But that's uh, that's. Yeah, I, I, I think. Let's hear from our other um, yeah, yeah, colleagues sure. first. Okay. Um, Oh, it's, I don't know where to begin because there's so much that's broken. I mean, I <laughs> wish that we didn't have to spend our time fundraising so that we could just focus on publishing and I wish that books could be free um, and that everyone could just access them. But if I'm not speaking in my fantasy and speaking more in practical terms, what I wish could happen um, that would, I think, really increase the visibility and, and forum that we have here um, is for plays to be included in any platform where books are reviewed and books are discussed and for plays to be featured in every bookstore, not just in the drama section, but in the literature section. I mean, this is what's so inspiring about UDP is that their books, their emergency play script books are included in the um, independent press section, um, not just the drama section, but I think it's about in schools, in universities, um, across all levels where we're talking about literature, where um, anytime people are talking about the arts and literature, that drama be a performance of all kinds, be included in that conversation, which I think does happen um, in other countries. Yeah, already, so it's possible. Um, yeah, and I mean being able to reimburse our artists more so that the that publishing plays could be more of a contribution to their um, to their practice, um, and to be able to um, reimburse the people who are contributing creatively to the press. Like right now, everything is volunteer, um, is entirely volunteerism, and so. Um, yeah, to be able to have a, an actual sort of supportive economy that allows allows people to make more work. Yeah, I would, uh, I mean, I think all, um, when 53rd State started, and I remember talking to Corinne about it in the early days, and um, and the how Three Hole um, Press does your, your covers, like the very specific thing that I think Annie's also talking about is like, feels like an artist's publication, and, other, and the artists who make this happen are themselves artists, they're yeah. doing this as volunteers, but they're also kind of grouping these things. So three whole press books, hopefully one leads to another, right? And similarly, 53rd State, like the subscription model is something that seems to have worked at times for us, maybe sometimes for 53rd State, um, but like the idea that someone would support by actually wanting to read the books and become a reader of that press and, uh, so if you can subscribe to some of these presses, that is always a very useful, helpful thing. And it's something that it's interesting to get a book in the mail. You know, like if you give it to somebody, a subscription to 53rd State, and you get a book now, your friend gets a book now and then, they're like, what is this? <laughs> I get to read this thing that I wouldn't have picked up, you know, because bookstores is, are difficult, especially in other parts of the country. And mm -hmm. to find the right bookstores, you know, um, and to find the right section and that kind of book in that section, you know. But um, I think a lot of our books, uh, um, all of the presses here, um, you know, are, are, are definitely both part of literature and, both, and also part of performance. So it's interesting that the audience isn't doubled, you know, isn't greater than <laughs> just one. But that seems to be how it, it, it is. It is pretty difficult. I mean, certainly things could change with institutional funding, things could change with, you know, but also the nature of the projects might change uh, in a way that may not suit, right? If we got, you know, if hmm. if suddenly we became just a, a, a part of a university, for instance, that has its own, you know, both benefits and also strictures. And if 53rd state suddenly became you know, like was given a million dollars, I think you would see like a change in, <laughs> in how, things, how things looked and where 
market it, and probably the investments would come with strings. And you know, today the NEA announced that they don't know if they're going to be accepting applications. So that's one thing we could at least have an NEA. I mean, that would be a good thing for a start. Well, but maybe um, <laughs> the Poetry Foundation, which got us very sizable support. Um, um, lately, of um, many, many millions, maybe there's a way to connect place to them. It could be an outreach to them, as a, and I'm happy to to do that. Maybe there is a way to um, um, have place, you know, as part of their also beautiful uh, website and outreach. But now I think it's time to uh, to open up, Michael, um, up there. Thank you for all your help. If you could put up some lights on the audience, um, we also have a mic. Not only so we really do understand you better after an hour of listening. Um, but um, um, also it is live uh, streamed and live recorded with um, Howl Around. The evening actually was announced na nationwide uh, tonight here because there is a, a feeling how significant publishing, in independent publishing, artist-driven really is. So um, if you have a question, um, um, you know, uh, raise your arm. I will point to you, take the mic, maybe say who you are, and uh, we start with you in the middle. You. Uh, here. Uh, one. Who, just put up your arm, who's, who wanted to say something? One, two, three. Okay. Hi, I, I sort of had a question that came to mind. I'm not a, uh, a playwright or anything else, but it's just, just somebody randomly from the, uh, in the audience. But I'm just wondering from the... <laughs> I mean, obviously it's very academic and so on and so forth. But um, I'm just wondering from the perspective of what I was hearing uh, as far as playwriting being so dynamic in the sense of, uh, I'm just wondering what uh, on-demand printing, if that's something that uh, is, is also part of this process, because obviously, you know, you talked about a play not being finished and, you know, and I'm just wondering uh, from the standpoint of, you know, getting, getting the work out there and so on, I'm just yeah. wondering if th that t new technology plays into yeah. publishing. So maybe the answer, on-demand printing, did it change the game a bit? I guess not for me, mostly because this is, um, yeah, I think I think all of us are working on our own time, and so a big part of the um, equation is just how much time do we put in as editors and publishers, and I think if we published a new script every time there was an edit, it would not be possible, it wouldn't be possible for me to do that, but, um, but there is some flexibility, like Alicia Harris's play was produced after it was published, and then we published a second edition that included some edits. So that happened a year later, but um, really, I think, I can't speak for Matt, Vi, and Kate, but it really has to happen around the free time that, that we have. So that does really inform the nature of the book. I wish it could be as nimble as playwriting is though. Like I, I wonder if there are zines out there that could do that or playwrights are doing that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, Hi. Um, thank you so much all of you for your time tonight. Uh, I guess this is a question for the, the playwrights, um, the writers. And I'm, I'm, this is an actual question. I don't know the answer. If you call yourself a playwright, <laughs> Is that because you intend the work to be performed? And if, if you are a poet or a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer, are you calling yourself that because you don't intend the work to be performed? And why can't any writing be performed? Why does it have to be called a play or fiction or nonfiction other than for a section in a bookstore or <laughs> finding it online? And uh, because it, it just makes me think of recently, I didn't go see it, but Joan Didion's The White Album was performed at BAM, which is, I don't think is an essay she ever wrote. I don't know. But thinking that someone would perf an actor would perform it on stage, but how exciting that a, that a, a sort of nonfiction fiction essay got to be performed. Anyway, so I'm just curious about calling oneself a playwright and what that means and what your intention behind that is. Thanks. For, for me, it means that I have a lot of help. Like, I just like, I, <clears throat> I'm usually writing like with specific people in mind, specific collaborators in mind, like objects and space in mind. Uh, so for me personally, it's always like really linked to realness, <laughs> like physical em embodiment and realness that uh, is like very, very specific 
and um, uh, and that's that's sort of what separates it for me. Just like a lot of help and a lot of like socializing, and, like friends. Uh, yeah. I um, especially this and um, where this play came from with everyday Afro play, which is a whole different different thing. Um, I write with collaborators in mind, which is kind of what he said. And um, I also, uh, with collaborators that I haven't met yet. And so, um, and I can, I try to write um, scenes or like try to create scenic poetry. And so I know that uh, for me, I, I'm a person that can write a novel, but right now, this is, uh, when I'm discussing this, I'm a playwright, but I, it's all very fluid. But in this sense, like when I'm writing plays, I'm writing, I'm writing with a whole world in mind from the collaborators to the audience. So that's what makes a, and I, I, I prefer actually dramatists because that I guess encompasses um, a different sensibility than just playwright. Does that make sense? It does. Can I? Oh. Yeah. No, I see. Let's let's have you do it. Yeah. Well, do you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I actually don't draw that much of a distinction, and I think that's because I um, am aware of how much I'm borrowing from poetry when I write. Not that I think that my um, language is poetic per se, but I uh, pay attention to the way poets use the page. And so I'm thinking about all of the communicative tools that are available to me when I'm writing a script. Um, and what feels similar, you know, in, in like any um, medium is uh, that it's meant for interpretation and I'm really aware of that. But the difference with a play script for me is that the interpreters of it are the designers and the director versus the sort of like one-on-one -on -one interpretation of a person with a page. But that's why I'm so excited by publishing is because I want that sort of interpretive possibility to be available to readers, not mediated by way of a production. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, I think in a similar vein, because we've been talking about this idea of publishing plays for readers versus performance, and Max said something along the lines of theater changes every 10 years, and we've also been talking about this idea of, you know, what to publish for someone that's only going to read it. Um, I guess my question for the playwrights and theater makers, um, is are you, are you willing to write a piece that gives up the potential to be performed and engage with other art forms, the novel, poetry, et cetera, in a way that other writers like novelists do? I think of like Shayla Hetty or something that like uses a lot of you know, drama and dialogue, you know, dramatic dialogue in her work. Are you willing to sort of go the other way, that two-way bridge and say, I'm going to make a hybrid play novel and give up the chance for performance? Um, and then for the publishers, is that marketable? Like where, where would you send that? Who would you market that to? Is that for the readers? Is that for the theater community? You know, I'm interested in that like hybrid and how you feel about that. I'm personally not willing to give up the chance for That's performance. Uh, I don't think, um, I don't know why I would ever have that impulse. I, I think even if, even if there were like these wild elements that were sort of page bound in some way, I um, yeah, I just I can't I I just uh, I mean maybe, but no yeah I think I just love the performance so much. I mean it's what I'm addicted to. That's why I, it's what it's what I do. So the, yeah, I personally know. I think, no, I don't want to, but I think I inadvertently did um, <laughs> on accident. Um, I, I, and maybe that's not true. I'm afraid. It's like a fear. It's like, oops, no one's going to do this. Um, because, it, I mean, just to tell you why, it's like got 33 characters, and it's, it's built from 
um, many different plays that are shaped together to make one play. So it's kind of a head spin. And in that way, yes, this is, it feels more like a book of poem plays than a play play. So yes, this is what this is. And oops, <laughs> I may have like made it unperformable. I don't know yet, but I'm hoping not. I don't think so. So it's in that space. I want to add, though, that this amazing Canadian collective oh, called right. Public Recordings read yes. Diana's play and was like, this is impossible. What can we do with it? Let's try to do something. And right. just invited Diana to go up. So who knows if that will be a play. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oops, I mean, sorry as a minute. publisher, I feel like your question is the question. And I, I have to kind of appreciate that our job is to simply bring the work into the hands of more people and we're not in control of what they do with it and that it's net good the more people encounter this work and some people will read it and then 10 years later they'll want to stage it. Some people will stage it with their friends around a table. Mm -hmm. Some people will bring it to their school and then a year later it will be taught in a classroom and then after we're all dead it will be staged. <laughs> like we just don't know. So I am trying to let go of being too anxious about that and just trust that since the work is so good and since it's so powerful, um, creative people will find a way to bring it to many forms of life. Um, I'm a big fan of hybrid text and I would absolutely give up <laughs> production um, in favor of like uh, what feels experimental and exciting in writing. That said, I can't really conceive of a piece of writing that couldn't be staged. Um, and I think it happens all the time. The easy solution is just for someone to read the impossible stage direction out loud, you know? Um, and, but there are a thousand other solutions and that's what's so exciting is it's a challenge to collaborators. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested in like the ways that we can sort of broaden our notions of performance. Like I think about the first time, one of the first times that I met Rachel, we read a play around her table, um, just as she said, and, and, and that was a performance. Or um, like I think about this book of um, Corinne Keithley's, which is called an, uh, Montgomery Park or Opulence, an essay in the form of a building. And, um, and a building is a performance, right? We're all inhabiting this space in a particular way that the architecture has um, defined for us and engaging with one another in a way that was scripted by the space. Um, and A Field Guide to Eye Landing is a collection of scores for urban ecologies and ways of inhabiting uh, and proposes um, hundreds of different ways of inhabiting cities and knowing urban spaces. Um, through performance as, as, a, um, as a kind of investigative mode. Um, and so all of those feel like, um, like, like spaces in which the, the hybridity of um, text and space um, and, and, a, and a kind of and opening up our notion of what a performance might be is really helpful. Uh, one or two more questions, one here, and then next. Hi, um, I am an actor turned mostly theater maker and recently made, made that decision because I just feel like the possibilities are more limitless when I make from scratch. Um, and I'm coming up against the issue of um, at what point do you put what you're making on paper in order to draw in collaborators, in order to draw uh, support. And uh, I was just wondering if, if any of you could speak to, if you have experience um, sort of in the theater making side or in the writing side where you found that it became crucial to really match what's on the page to what the audience is going to experience in order to help the thing grow, basically. I don't know if that makes sense or, because I guess I could just add that my piece is um, improvisational dance, but also there's text and a lot of imagery going on. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out the next step in terms of gaining collaborators and sort of communicating that vision without necessarily having a place to perform it yet or, or do those sorts of things. 
Uh, oh, no, I don't. Yeah, they have to answer first. Then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think the page space is really helpful in making the performance for me. I um, in formatting my own plays, I often feel like I don't know what the play, the play's tone until I've figured out how it looks on the page. And so that um, that process is helpful. And I think is like, and that making process is maybe a different one than the publishing process, which is so much in conversation with the the already there. You know, they're like two sides of the the same coin. I also think about what Corinne, a project that you're working on, <laughs> sorry to <laughs> throw you on, but the paper list. I don't know that this is a response at all to what you were just discussing, but what Kate is referencing is um, I proposed via the sort of like, you know, you apply for um, residencies and grants or whatever, and so I um, proposed a project where I would compose a piece um, each month totally orally. I compose it and then give it to the performer so that it never interacted with the page. Mm. Um, and it uh, has been something I've avoided at all costs. <laughs> 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 and how much I disliked the project has taught me how much I need the page. Um, <laughs> because I think it revealed to me what is satisfying about writing, which has so much to do, it turns out, with layout on the page. Um, and um, with my being able to hold the whole scope of a project and seeing what on the first page speaks to what is on the last page, if you know what I mean? And there was something that happened when the, uh, when the oral piece accumulated and like became, it became unwieldy and I like could no longer recognize my writing as my writing or as what I would call good for myself. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't think that's an answer. That is just <laughs> my relationship with when it's time to write something down. Um, this is, I was working a night job and I really wanted to come on time to this panel, but I did just came, so I'm, I was late because I, I had to leave work anyway, which is luckily two blocks away. This is probably a boring question, but I'm just gonna ask it. Um, I'm, my background is in video art slash filmmaking, photography, and then I end up making performances like the past five to seven years. So I guess my question is, like I've come more and I made a play two years ago, a big play, and I'm sort of in this hybrid space between art, theater, film, and like, like just floating on the margins, but I do feel like the writing really is what my work's about but I feel like I'm not almost in any world and I don't think the art world's so great at like res always respecting people making performance in it, you know? And so is, I guess this is more like a boring question as I said. So if I were to think about, I, I've self-produced films and my live play. I would like the text to circulate other than me making it as a zine. But is there space for people like me, or is it more like you're a playwright and a novelist and poet? And you like I don't publish, I don't write that much. I write a lot of weird, different texts. They're all for performance. But I think what becomes a film for me and what becomes a play, they're like the text actually does dominate. So I want to think about these spaces. I just am curious about that. Someone who doesn't like I. Denna, more an artist, but the writing is part of the art. It's probably a dumb question. As I, I, I don't think that's a boring question at all. I think that um, I really want that exact um, occupation and space caught between so many disciplines to be viewed as incredibly legitimate. And I think I was talking about this with Annie before we started the panel, but I think all of us in some ways have a really cynical relationship to capital T theater and also a very earnest relationship <laughs> to theater. We're trying to make it on our own terms. And I think I, want, I wanted to make Three Hole because I think there are so many important artists who are really informed by other disciplines and care about theater and text, but don't identify with contemporary playwriting or theater culture. Um, 
for so many very valid reasons, and it's really hard to promote your own work. Um, it takes so much energy, psychological energy, and and so I, I wonder um, how can we as artists do that for one another, you know? And you might not want to make your own zine, but I mean, how can you make something for someone else and then suddenly it doesn't, it becomes more legitimate, um, I think, when we make space for each other, you know? And I think that's what these presses all are um, at various stages of like institutional scale. Can I? I will say my um, the reason why I'm here is because I, um, as a just a sort of um, heal not healing but just sort of meditative outlet for myself. I began writing every day and posting it online on my website as just a like I don't really care. I'm just putting this out. And then randomly, I got an email from Rachel saying, I want to publish your work. And I didn't, there was no, I, there, that wasn't something that I, I hated even thought of, really. And so I guess this is very esoteric and like kind of woo woo, but mm -hmm. if you put it out there, like literally something will happen. It has to. And it sounds like you're on a, your own course. And so am I. And I, a, lot of, a lot of times I have no idea what's going to happen the next day. But as long as I'm doing my practice, I trust that my practice will serve something. I want to give a shout out to also Will Arbery, who has um, just edited his own anthology through 53rd State, coming from this exact impulse in some way. W will you talk a little bit about that, actually? Oh, well, no, I mean, 53rd State Press had. The, there had been this one thing called the occasional, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, it was edited. It was edited by Paul Lazar, and it ha he uh, asked a question, and then all these amazing people responded to it. And I thought it was so cool, and I was so moved when I read it. And then I asked Kate if I could. <laughs> Because it had been a while, and there wasn't another one. I was like, it really is occasional, but but now, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just it's available for pre-order now. And actually, this row of th <laughs> these three people are all included in the, um, and Kate helped me edit it. And there's just like a lot of amazing theater makers and performers, and um, it was really fun. It was really fun, and it, yeah, I, I just totally agree with what you said. Like, just like reaching out to other people, supporting them and giving them a, a platform it just makes everything feel more real in this crazy way. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to add one thing in that you're probably the perfect reader and audience member for, um, for these three presses, um, Freehold, 53rd Street, Ugly Duckling, and a number of others publishing in the realm of what seems interesting to you, including a few very small artist book oriented presses um, which you know, I'm sure all of us could recommend to you. So, if you become one of the readers of those presses, I think you are. It is easier to find a way to um, get your work out into the world as you see how people are doing that that are sharing your interests. Um, it's one thing to self-publish; it's very difficult, and you can do it through Amazon. You can do it through all these different ways. But the thing that a publisher does that Rachel is alluding to, I think, is, and I think all of us have done actually because we've all kind of worked together also uh, as colleagues in the field, is, uh, you know, your work, the work of these artists comes into conversation with historically different work, uh, work by their peers. Um, you know, in a way, 53rd State has established like a whole maybe like sub aesthetic or a particular aesthetic that's been going on for a while and and has made that available um, in a way that, that is really laudable and uh, I think three whole is doing that and and creating communities each of these presses creates communities of viewers readers uh, artists performers etc so I think it's important to become a reader in order to know how to make your text uh, appear in that world in the world you want it to appear in you know, become one of the participants of these kinds of things, you know? Yeah. Do you guys have like yep. a subscription? Like how 
Yeah, I had mentioned subscriptions. Yeah, I think everybody here probably, except maybe Should. three hole, but they, <laughs> after tonight they, they will. We have the book table. Uh, and we have uh, the book table. Yeah, there's a book table outside. outside and uh, really and I just wanted to say that I'll be out there and we can take credit cards and we can take cash and all the books are discounted spectacularly for tonight. Yeah. So please do support the presses um, um, also with buying books. That is important. And it's a democratic process. It's very important. I mean, the 60s, everybody wanted to write. Everybody published. There were hundreds of art journals. It was a great time. Think of the time of Benjamin Franklin, Philadelphia. had 25,000 people there, 17 daily papers. Um, it's a part of uh, being a, a, a good citizen is to read and also to publish and to write. Um, often there is no audience. We are publishing a book by a Polish playwright, Witkiewicz, um, all 23 plays for the first time in English. At his time, nobody read his plays. Nobody performed his plays. It was never in theater. He wrote it for an audience that wasn't even there, but it was in written form. When it was first published, it was already no longer kind of new, but somehow it was preserved. So this is also important work that they all do. From our workshop of the device theater, from the dramatist guild, we learned only if you have something in writing on a page as a play and you put up, legally it exists, you have a right, it shows your creation. Mm -hmm. If it's not put down in the word form, it somehow it's legally at least, it doesn't, it's not even fully there. So it's also a very important factor that it shows clear who owns it, who did it, uh, what time it was done, it was put in a form. And then um, I just noticed as a last uh, comment when, you put the book down, uh, you take it back up, the, the, the balance of the table changed, you see? <laughs> so it has a materiality. It, 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 it is also part of a universe. You create an object which changes things. So um, what more uh, reason uh, uh, do we need? So really, do uh, thank you all for coming. Well, Buy the book, support them. Before we end them. the evening, and we have uh, two more artists to hear from for yeah, just one minute. We are low, close to eight, but we could do that, yes. Uh, do do we, we, well, no, I mean we go to the end of the readings now. Yes, yes. We're closing. Yes, precisely. Yes, so we all go back now and we're going to do the uh, uh, closing readings. <laughs> I guess we did. Okay, so um, this is uh, from my play, Wood Calls Out to Wood. Um, the exercise of the play was to translate Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, the painting, the triptych, to the page, um, which then of course had another interpretation uh, when it was staged. Um, and so I tried to replicate the viewer's experience of encountering the painting. And I thought about approaching that in three different sort of like um, layers or levels. So approaching um, the painting as its materials, um, approaching the painting as like swaths of color and texture, and then finally um, approaching the painting as narrative with some of the like uh, characters emerging from it. So I'm just gonna read um, the opening monologue, which is from that first section of thinking about materials of the play. Okay. If you were a tree, maybe you'd think that your only job was to breathe in deep and to lift your arms up, up, up in exaltation. And sure, okay, that's part of it. That's the forest part of it. But trees also become books and bookshelves. Trees become tables for breakfasting. It can be hard to think about that part of the cycle. <laughs> in any case, I was felled in 1460. This much we know, uh, and then began a process, a very, very long process of becoming a surface. Many dark years of not knowing what would become of me. I was sure it was the end, and maybe it was. I mean, definitely it was, but also, you know, obviously not. <laughs> and of course I had to wonder, very deeply to wonder why. The ugliest inside parts of me made to be painted and studied and hung on a wall. And all the other parts? Well, I still don't know what happened to those. Anyhow, it took me a long time to accept uh, that it's all still me, or that maybe even that something within me was seeking the saw, wanted the sanding, needed the studio, 
that I had something coming to me, yes, something that I could only get from being made into segments and rearranged and hinged back together again. Oh, I know how all of this sounds, I do, but I think it sometimes, how even there in the forest, hundreds of miles away, something in me was calling out to that painter, a painter who, and I should say, I don't really believe in coincidences, who had the very same name as my own, Bosch, Wood. The both of us would be coming. Yes, it took a long time, it did, uh, but once again, finally, I throw my pains open and I exult in what I am saying. Oh yes, oh yes, in every weird note of it. And then that character draws a curtain back on himself. <laughs> Play begins. So I'm reading from The Immeasurable Want of Light. And um, so I will read the first, um, this play tr loosely tracks a character called Mocker, who um, exists in a faraway ex galaxy that's kind of like a very dark galaxy and an artist colony at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so um, there's, a, I also note there's a narrator throughout this play that sort of connects all the plays together. Um, and so I'll read, I will read that first, I'll read the first bit of narration to sort of describe the space and then right into the first monologue. A black body undresses, slips into a pond of liquid substance, tiny letters shaped lights, blink out of their face, neck and arms. Words bubble into sentences, into whole mercurial text, until the, until the entire pond is overflowing with viscous luminous. The body exhales. Assume that you're refreshed, despite being in complete darkness. Two, 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 six, six, three, decimal point, six, four. This is the number of the weight of mass that I carry to be here, to be visible to you in this space. This is the number now, right now, today, tomorrow, or next week, next month, next year, the number will have increased. Let's go backwards a bit. In 2016, the number was two, one, three, zero, eight, zero, decimal point, three, six. So that means the weight has accrued an, at an interest rate of 4.5%, which added nine, five, eight, three, decimal point, two, eight times. My question is, how do I exist underneath that weight and still be visible? Am I visible to you? Can you see me? How do I, how do you know, how do you, how do you, oh my God. How do you know how I appear? But there isn't yet any light. I think it's because of the weight. Let's go forward a bit or maybe out. Dark matter is an invisible, invisible to the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It emits no light itself, but it's where light is made. This substance takes up 80% of the universe, but we actually can't measure it yet. Undetectable yet essential, massive, only observable by watching other celestial bodies act and react in relation. Okay, stepping back on course. We'll go over how this happened. I signed up for this. I sought an escape from serving other people food. Hopefully, many, many people on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. The more people I made happy through my undying love of making them happy, the closer I would get to one, zero, zero, which is a good number if you, when you add it up, it's seven, zero, zero dollars after seven days of making people happy by showing them that you are happy serving them. 
The only downside to this math is that it costs me more than one zero zero to be happy making other people happy. Do I need to explain that? The taxation, the debits, the subtraction, the division, the separation, energy divested from itself to, and rerouted to another source. Sadly mimicking the sun with warm fluorescence as I hand you your delicious plate of monkfish and manila clams with Hubbard squash chorizo and a Parmesan broth. Maybe it was simple. Work rage, flint against stone with the right amount of force at just the right angle. An explosion happened to me, inside me, quite undetectable to this human eye. I got heavier. I gained weight, mass, no longer able to radiate enough light to serve food. Despite warnings from people, I learned, I leaned into this reversal. I grabbed at it forcefully with a desperation, gaining mass exponentially. Should have been a deterrent. Failing wardrobe, misshapen body, getting all, all out of sorts. I kept reaching and falling back and down. Now I am here with this mass of two, 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 six, six, three, decimal point, six, four. This is the number, this number is the weight I carry to be here, to be visible to you in this space. Did I make the right choice? Because what I carry is debt. A financial albatross, Nelnet, Sally Mae, Chase Bank, Bank of America, it doesn't matter the name of the debt, but the size of that number sure does mean something. I mean, it's almost the weight of a sun or three, or so, oh, sunshine. I can no longer emit any light to make other people happy by pretending that I was happy serving them. Dark matter that I have become, I chose to carry this weight to emit no light to instead be gravitational and black and heavy, looking more like Octavia Butler or Audre Lorde or better still, Maya Angelou. Not fuckable whatsoever. Don't get me wrong. I feel all the love that they bring. I should never even compare myself to them at all because I am not, will never amount to their weight in the universe. They hold sway in their own galaxy it's just on days when I must choose between buying a tube of toothpaste or a loaf of bread, I re-realize that being fuckable is required to be funded. I still chose the weight, this debt over admitting sunshine. I like my invisibility. I see you, but you can't see me. Yes, actually this is fun. Don't worry, I'm used to the weight now, learning, it to learning to carry it gracefully. Here I can observe and work and speak and be true. True as black, true as dark, and true as matter, ever, ever expanding. So hopefully see you at the archive bar on uh, 63rd, uh, on 30, no, no, what is it? Uh, it's th 36 between Madison and Pips. And again, a, a really a big applause for our publishers. It's a celebration of their work and to the artists who came to now. Thank you.